Hey, are you looking for 2024 to be the best year of your marriage yet? Well, then I think and hope and pray that you have come to the right spot. The following video is a discussion that we had where anybody from our church at our event could text in any question they had after a teaching that our lead pastor did. And we're going to get into all sorts of topics from how do you rebuild trust if it's been breached? Uh, if you're omitting something, is that lying? We get into questions around what if there's differences in expectation around frequency and intimacy? And we have a whole conversation around submission. And so I think that it's going to be helpful. Uh, we got a lot of great feedback that people were interested in uh, listening again or sharing it with their friends. And so our hope and our prayer is that this is helpful and valuable, not just for your head, but for your heart as well. I hope you enjoy. All right, guys. Well, thank you, Pastor Bob, for uh, sharing with us to start our evening. Uh, I can tell you guys behind the scenes, there was already an argument up on stage up here. I said, I said, one of the most popular questions is what was the movie you went to go see? Yeah. So what'd you say? I can't remember the name of the movie. I, it was a skiing movie. That's as okay. much as I remember about it. Yeah, and like but, I said, it was, we, it was like 1981, so nobody's going to know it anyways. But we were married in 1986, and we only dated two and a half years, so it can't be 81. So, yeah, it was... <laughs> they, but then they went back and forth. They went back and forth for a while. I was like, well, I guess, I guess we'll talk about conflict, too. Uh, so, uh, all right, so we don't know the name of the movie. Um, can you guys... The, the number one question was, does Jonathan take steroids, or is that all natural? You're a pharmacist, so maybe you have a take on this. I can assure you, Nathan. Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> That's your son. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I know. Believe it or not. Okay, more serious questions here. What's the difference between wanting your spouse to grow hmm. and trying to make them change? It's a good one. <laughs> it is. That's a very good question. All right. Um, the first thing I would say is it can be the same thing. But I think the question that, to sort it out whether it's just you wanting them to change is, is why you want that. If it's just to make my life easier, then I think another series of questions would be worth asking or a different kind of conversation. Do you want this person to become the best that they can be or do you want them to become the easiest person to live with? And if it's the second, there is a kind of selfish component to that, right? And so it, it's worth it's worth doing some reflection into that. But it is possible that what you want to see change is also growth in them. That, that's not outside the realm of possibility. And, and the growth is always with the, with the end point of growing together. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to grow together as a couple um, and helping each other in that growth area. Yeah, because I feel like part of it, too, is even trying to analyze your own motive. Is this for my, like, own self-serving purpose? Like, this is why I want you to grow and change, because this will make my life easier, better? Or, like, what, what's, the, what's the thing under the thing there, I think, is, is really key when you're trying to figure out, yeah, am, am I trying to get them to grow for me and what I want or for them and what's going to make them the best person, too? There are aspects of my personality that are a little anal. You're learning a lot about me tonight. So, so we had a kitchen that had a, a, a three-way switch, right? And so I really like it when I come in and up is on. And, mm -hmm. and Sue mm -hmm. just doesn't care whether up is oh, on or, or Sue, not. Sue, Sue, Sue. And so, so very, very early in our marriage, I just, I lovingly recommended that, that up being on was, was, was a good way to go. And, and she just told me that's not going to happen. <laughs> and so, so I made an adjustment. So, so uh, <laughs> when you meet somebody, there's things about them that are interesting to you. Yeah. Or that, that you decide this is something you could come alongside for the rest of your life. And my husband is a very intense person. He's very intense and he's very specific. And there's, there's ways that work and there's things that don't work. And... Uh, you know, I, I found that secure. I thought that was interesting. I knew that that would bring us some adventures in life. 
But, after, you know, over the course of one and two and three decades, that sometimes the light switch thing, you know, is a part of that intensity that I loved in the first place. And so um, just because the thing about them that you love that is now becoming maybe a little irritating, what you have to, like my thought was, if I was that intense all the time, that would like exhaust me. Maybe he's exhausted and he just doesn't know how to step away from that. So maybe that's like an, an idea of, I, I didn't want to change him in his intensity, but you know, I thought that it would be worth the conversation as you know, maybe if you didn't have to worry about the light switch when you walked in the house every day, that would be just one less thing to, to have to process. Maybe that would be better. That's a better version of that conversation than I got. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, just a heads up, the, this mic is not working on live stream. It is working in here, but not on live stream. So we'll, like, we'll rotate around. It'll, it'll work out. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this, is a, this is another good one uh, around intimacy. Should you always say yes when your spouse initiates sex in a healthy way? Thoughts on this versus saying no if you are truly tired, timing is off, you kind of like you're not feeling it, that kind of a thing. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah. <laughs> I think that in an in, in individual situation, a quick communication about that moment is like if you're communicating well outside of of that, then you're going to communicate well when sex is happening or wanting to be happened. Um, and so there, in the instant, there can be quick communication about that, and then an understanding has come to. If there is a trend, then that's a conversation that needs to be set up and happen outside of that time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Um, what, what would you say if, if you're the spouse and you're feeling like the other spouse is just continually saying no, it's leading to disappointment, you know, what, what are your guys' advice on, on that situation? Yeah, so um, I've never met two people who have the exact same libido. There's always someone who wants more and always someone who wants less. Oh, um, my Siri device. just said, I don't know how to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> there is something Siri still doesn't know. She's such a coward. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, uh, the challenge always is when someone is saying no, how the other person is interpreting that. It often feels like rejection or something like that. And so along with the no, I think there, there has to be some responsibility that just acknowledges, you know, why this is not the best time. Um, I heard a counselor say this one time, and I was uh, dumbstruck by it. I, I thought that there must be something really true in it. And that is, uh, especially when you have uh, kids, uh, and kids can be an, an, an amazing source of emotional support. Like we always think of them as being <laughs> exhausting. They can also be a source of emotional support. And uh, I was listening to a, a counseling session, and the 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 spouse said, I just don't, at the end of the day, I just don't have anything else to give. And the counselor asked, is it possible you just don't have anything else that you want? Because that emotional bucket has been filled earlier in the day. And I think that those are, are questions that are worth asking. But uh, I think it's helpful to know that it, it, if you're not on the, the you know, you, you want sex, at the same frequency. You know, there's just some people who want more. Some people, it's not that significant to them. But that is a conversation. And then when we talked about mutual sacrifice, there are ways to be mutually sacrificial to help our spouse in that. Now, what if you're the spouse who's in a spot where you're, you're not feeling it, you're not really wanting it, and then it like leads to guilt of like, oh, I'm not providing for my spouse in this kind of a way, um, but you don't want to be fake, you know, that kind of a thing. 
you know, what might you say to that person that's kind of struggling internally with, I, I'm not, I don't really want to have sex with my spouse for whatever reason, whether good or bad. Um, if they're there, what, what would you say to somebody who's in that spot? I think if there's a lot of awkwardness and confusion about that, a, a conversation with a counselor can be helpful to clarify that. But um, as I mentioned earlier, things show up in the bedroom before they show up in other places. And it's, it's the most sensitive and vulnerable place that we have. And so if something's not working somewhere else, that is where it shows up. And that could mean that ne there needs to be either some professional help or some ongoing conversations. Um, yeah. I think it's helpful for both people, but for the person who's maybe feeling more resistant or put upon or just not desiring this is to have, and a counselor is always very helpful, but to have a better understanding of, of where that comes from. So many things do come from our family of origin. Is that where it's coming from? Is it a, is it a biology thing? Um, you know, uh, women, we, it's six months after we've had a baby, our bodies are still wonky, but we don't look wonky on the outside. And maybe, you know, you are wondering why you're not feeling like you used to feel. So it can be biology, it can be just exhaustion, it can be emotional, it can be family of origin. And it's super helpful to be able to talk to somebody who can help you put labels on those things. And when you understand better what is happening inside of you, you can communicate that better. And then that comes to a better understanding and a better solution. Hmm. Next question, how can you develop trust after trust has been breached? Um, well, you probably have heard me say this on Sunday. Forgiveness is a gift. Trust is earned. And trust has to be rebuilt. And often the, the steps required to rebuild trust feel like punishment to the person who's trying to rebuild the trust. So let's say there's been infidelity in the marriage and one person has been betrayed and the other person has violated their, their marriage vows. And now they're trying to put this back together. And so one of the things is, you know, so how can we put accountability in so that I don't have to be afraid you're somewhere you shouldn't be? And then that person can interpret it as, well, why, why don't you trust me? You know, why do you want to follow me on your phone? By the way, uh, Soon can know where I am any time of the day or night. She, she can track me on her phone, and, and she often does because she's worried I'm going to get lost. <laughs> but uh, the, the idea is, is that that system of accountability is what builds trust. And so I'd, I'm not trying to hide a part of my life. And so that helps to establish trust. I think that when we feel like trust is someone treating us like a child, we'll resist it and, and we'll fight back against it. And all I can tell you is, is that it's, it's fair to have conversations about that. And if you have broken trust, you have to be willing to do the work to rebuild the trust. And it's gonna take you longer to rebuild it than it took you to broke it. Yeah, that's break true. it. That's true. Yeah, I was even thinking about this like on a very practical thing, like you brought up the phone thing that um, I feel like one of the ways that uh, I'm able to keep trust in my relationship with Sarah is like open access to my phone and any, any apps within it, you know? Right. So any place there could be any kind of messaging or uh, yeah, social media, email, uh, yeah, and even like knowing where I would be and things of that nature. Um, like, yeah, she, she just, and sometimes she will, she'll just pick up my phone and just be going through whatever. And like that in and of itself is accountability to me. And, and I don't think that that's where accountability should stop in our lives, but I do feel like it's a real way that we've been able to develop and can, you know, maintain trust trust in this world where there's just like access all the time to all of the things. And I guess what I would even say, if, if you're in a spot where you're feeling like, Ugh, I, I wouldn't want <laughs> my spouse to see everything on my device, um, then that would be a, in, in a situation where I would say, that's, that's a time to start talking to somebody. Right. Like maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a close friend, maybe it's a counselor, 
But what the enemy always does is he tries to keep us isolated in the dark. Yep. And so if, 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 if it's not exposed, we can't deal with it. Like what's the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous? Like admit there's a problem. If you, if you, keep, if you keep it in the dark, it's gonna stay there and you're gonna stay stuck in that habitual sin. Right. If you're looking to get free, you have to say it. The book of James, you know, he says, confess your sins and you will be healed. Like it, it all, it goes together. And so I think, I think part of that uh, can be, even if you've uh, been in a spot where you have broken trust, I think um, not looking at it as my spouse is babying me, looking at it as I'm doing whatever it takes to rebuild the trust because this relationship matters. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Um, and in different, different times of marriage. So when you're first married, it's easy to think that, you know, we're so much in love. We've talked so much about what we want our future to look like. And then you get married and then maybe there's, maybe it's not a huge thing. Maybe it's a smaller thing, but you're not, you feel doubt or you're not trusting your spouse in a situation. And then the thought can come into your head. Well, does that mean I really love them or was this a mistake? Or then you start having doubts. And so when you've, we've been married 37 years, I did the math before I got up here because I never remember. <laughs> so we've been married 37 years and we've gone through decades of building trust with each other. But in the beginning, I think we need not to assume that we're gonna 100% trust the person all the time or we're gonna 100% uh, feel bubbly in love with them all the time, or, you know, so many things you have to bump up against and realize that it's not, it doesn't mean that you made a mistake. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you don't trust them, but it is a learning thing. And as time goes on, you know, that is one of the beautiful things of being in a relationship with someone for a long time is the time has gone on and you are able to sit comfortably in a lot of things, which leaves you open to be able to spend a lot of energy learning about and adventuring in other areas. Um, this, is, this is a related topic, but uh, is omitting lying? What do you think about that? It certainly can be. Um, I guess it would depend. Is the attempt to deceive, mm -hmm. is that the intention? I, I think that's an important component of it. Uh, it would not be uh, beneficial for me to share all of my thoughts with Sue. Mm -hmm. um, As somebody who sits in like five hours of meeting with, week with you, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you probably wish I'd share a few less from time to time. Yeah. <clears throat> No, I, I think that, uh, that's, that's a good question. I think that it does go to the motive. And sometimes uh, we're omitting something because we're not trying to cause pain or irritation. But sometimes we're omitting something because we are afraid of dealing with the conflict that will come from it, or we're afraid of disclosing something that will, will have to become accountable in some area of our life. And so I, I, I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth asking yourself, you know, why am I not disclosing this? That's a good question. Right. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a good one. Um, I, I felt this one. How does one guard from drift due to busy lives? Seems we might put other things on our schedule first, leaving little margin for each other. Uh, what works well? What advice do you have? I probably shouldn't say anything about this. Uh, because my tendency is to overwork and fill my life up too much. I have a real hard time saying no. And uh, so that's been difficult for me. My solution has been to trust Sue to tell me when I, I need to uh, throttle back and include more family time. And when she does that, I don't think she has an ulterior motive. I'm not, I don't think she's trying to control my life. I think she's trying to make sure that our marriage and, and when we were doing the parenting thing, that, that that was healthier. So I don't know if you have. Oh, so much. I have so much to say. <laughs> what time is it? Um, Get comfortable, Pastor Bob. 
So yes, in our life, in our life, I run the schedule and I always have, and it has manifested in many different ways. When the kids were home, it was the huge calendar on the door. Everybody had a different color. You know, I would, our, we both have our calendars synced on our phone. We've done that forever. Um, for a while, we would have Monday morning breakfast, and Monday morning breakfast was when we sat down and we went over the week and who's gonna be where and who's gonna pick up who. Um, and so the assumption needs to be that busyness is going to invade in your relationship. Yeah. It just is. Don't be surprised. It's going to happen. And so always be on the lookout for it. And then the solutions for it change depending on what stage of life you're in. So when we were first married and we didn't have any kids, you know, I remember one time, I don't remember if I showed up at, at work or you came home and I said, you know, pack an overnight bag, we're going and I had planned a little getaway for us and we, <laughs> and we, you know, took off and did that. We were able to do that because we didn't have the kids. Um, and so it has to look like different things. There was a season when he was super busy and I would make an appointment. I would call the church and I would make an appointment to come in and see him during the day. And that was my time with him. You know, um, it was a little snarky, but it was <laughs> that way, it was a way to do that. So, and then, yes, I would plan the vacations and I would say, this is what we need to do. This is when we need to be gone. Um, understanding with him that when he, he doesn't do a, what do you call it when you vacation at home? He doesn't do that. Staycation. Yeah, he doesn't, staycations don't work. So Bob needs to get away. He needs to look at an ocean. He needs to stick his feet in the sand. He needs to be, uh, you know, just away. He needs to leave his phone at the hotel. And, and so because, and that's okay with me, you know, made for nice vacations, but it was understanding that, you know, I can take a week off and stay at home and do a few projects and, and ignore what's happening and he's unable to do that. So, and our understanding from the beginning was that was going to kind of be what this was gonna look like. And so I didn't resent being the person, I don't resent being the person who's planning the trips and, and always enjoying finding new things for us to do, new things for him to do. So it does look different at, at the different stages that you're in and don't be surprised because life is gonna, busyness happens. Yeah, I feel like too, I'm, I'm in that like messy middle time right now. Um, and so uh, like literally I, I realized this afternoon that I was like, wait, both my kids have activities tonight Sarah's serving in kids' church. I'm supposed to be on stage. I have one kid getting a ride, but the other one doesn't. Like, what am I going to do? So, like, I, this literally happened to me today. And uh, so I live streamed this event as I drove to a dance studio, picked up my daughter, and drove back. And she's now in kids' church. But I, I do feel like one of the things that's um, been helpful for uh, us as we're in the midst of like sports and church and, and all the things is um, to, to really say, what is our vision for our marriage and what, what do we value most and how do we make sure that our calendar is reflecting that? Because it's just too easy for too many other opportunities for the kids or even for us to creep in. And then it's like, oh man, like it feels like we're roommates and we're ships passing in the night and you know, that kind of a thing, both working full time, like the, the whole thing. So I, um, one of the things that we even just implemented this calendar year, starting in September, was, uh, was just like a weekly date night. We were on a bi-weekly and we would actually like organize a babysitter and do that. And then like we kept getting frustrated because like babysitters fall through or like, oh, this schedule gets changed and all this. And so I was like, man, this is really actually ended up being like once a month. And like, you've probably been there <laughs> if, if, if you got the kids and this sort of thing. And then it was almost feeling like, is it even worth it to try to get a babysitter? Which I, I do think it is. But what we, what we decided is that um, given the kids 
schedules and calendars. We said, hey, every Tuesday night, there's not a thing. And so we are going to like X that out. Like we're not going to have anybody over. We're not gonna do anything extra. Um, like we're gonna send the kids up to bed early and we're, we are gonna do the like stay at home date night, but we're gonna do it every single week. And like, it's as immovable as soccer practice is. Like if, if my son has a game, I get him there. If I've got a date with my wife, I gotta show up, I gotta be there. Like it's the same thing. And so like having both that mindset of what's my vision, I want a healthy, strong marriage, which means I need to spend intentional time. And then making my calendar reflect that has been super helpful. And what that has actually meant is that like my son wants to sign up right now for another sport and we told him no and maybe I'm depriving him or something. I don't know, he'll get counseling here someday, I'm sure, if he put it, put it on the list here. But, you know, but I'm like, no, I, I think, I actually think it's good for him to have some home time and just like, you know, go in your room and like try to entertain yourself for an hour without any screens. Like, you can do this, son, I believe in you. Um, but, but also, like, this is what's gonna create the most healthy family rhythm. So uh, that's, that's what we're, uh, going through right now with the busy lives. Um, this, is, this is a spin off of that, that same question. We both tend to put the children first as our highest priority, but I think this can build resentment as individual needs are ignored. How do you balance the, the, this whole tension here? Yeah, that's, that's a good question too. Um, I would say that in our experience, our kids had seasons when they favored one parent over the other. As a parent, you can never say you favor a child, but the children will tell you who they favor pretty easily. Um, so like we had to, to work through that. Um, say the question again, because I don't want to drift. Uh, we, we both tend to put the kids children first. first as our highest priority, but it can build resentment over time as our individual needs are ignored. Yeah, I think you have to have the conversation about what needs are being ignored, but I can tell you that the greatest gift you can give your children is, is a healthy marriage. True. Because they're going to go, and a lot of their patterns that they employ in developing relationships are things that they learn at home. And if you prioritize each other, uh, that's going to be something that they can bring to their relationships. And that's, that's a gift that you can give them. And then the way I've thought about it is uh, uh, I, I'm married to Sue for the rest of my life and uh, uh, the kids are, uh, you know, they've left home. And they, I would just look at them and think to myself, you're going to leave me and she's not, so I'm, I'm going with her. Mm -hmm. That's how that. Yeah. I remember growing up and understanding that my parents were a team and I, I was their child and they loved me and I was, I was their family, but I wasn't, I wasn't part of that team. And I, I remember just talking about that as the kids came and, and were young is that, I, I don't know, I guess I wasn't worried about them feeling less than because we love them dearly and they're our family, but dad and I are always the team and we're gonna be the team together forever. Um, so it was just something that we communicated to them in a loving way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, one of the things that you brought up, Pastor Bob, was uh, pornography, and thank you for opening up uh, uh, that conversation as well. How, how should you handle active pornography use from your spouse in a marriage? Who keeps them accountable, and how do you have trust in them again? Yeah, well, uh, part of it is just the unbelievable, ex unbelievable accessibility and all the ways that that can be hidden. And so there are reasons why a person is attracted to and possibly addicted to pornography. And, and the longer you wait to deal with that, you're just, you're causing more pain for yourself and for the people that you love. And so you have to be willing to have the hard conversations and do the hard work and, and that comes with an acknowledgement of when failure occurs. Um, so it's, it's, it's super hard because it's so accessible and it's, it's, it's so private, 
but it can do so much damage. I think that the wife can't, I won't say it that way. I don't think that the wife should be expected to be the accountable person for her spouse if he's the one who's addicted to pornography or vice versa. That you have to bring someone in from outside to help create that line of accountability because it is super hard. You're already trying to rebuild trust and restore a relationship that's been damaged and maybe you feel somewhat insecure because they're seeing someone that maybe you think they think they look better or something like that. It's, it's just, there's so, that brings so much to the soup. You, you just don't want to do that. So, uh, bring someone else in to be the accountability partner and then be ruthlessly honest. Uh, and that's challenging, it's difficult, but if, uh, if you pretend with your accountability partner, you can't get better. So I'm so glad that the next event will be a Christian counselor who specializes in family relationship and, and children. And there are some things that are gonna come up that, that you, the spouse, or that both of you are not equipped to handle. And pornography is absolutely one of those things. Both people need to have someone that they can talk to that's a safe place who is skilled and knows how to walk a couple through this. And so if it's not pornography, it might be something else. It might be anger issues. It might be who knows what. But there are things, there are times when a counselor is needed and that frees up the two people to be spouses to each other and not have to have all the answers all the time. Just the only other thing that I would add to that, that I, I don't mean to intend by what I said that if a spouse sees that their spouse has failed in that area, they shouldn't bring it up. I just think that like absolutely you should do that. But the, the goal is that if you become the accountability partner, it, that changes the dynamic a lot and, and that'll make the marriage hard. Yeah, because now the spouse is like, are they the accountability partner? It's, and it's, it's so intertwined with intimacy and like it, yeah, it can get really messy and really challenging. Now, what about if, um, so in that situation, so say um, one spouse who's struggling with pornography, they go and they, they get accountability with somebody else. What, <laughs> what does the role look like then for communication back to the spouse? Or would you say like, that's where we really need to get a professional involved because like it might be different on different situations. Like, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I think there's a lot of uniqueness to how a couple handles that. You know, part of the accountability can be, you know, maybe that accountability partner gives some feedback to the spouse. Maybe there's a, an arrangement with a counselor. Like, those are things that you can sort out. Um, what you don't want to create is a, a dynamic where this person can be involved in pornography, their accountability partner is aware, it's their private secret, and, the, and that continues to grow as a dominant influence in his, in his or her life. We really want to, to break those patterns. And I think what you said earlier about bringing things out to the light, that's where healing takes place. Everything we hide hurts us, mm -hmm. it's just true. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's bring up the old submission, you know, <laughs> as if sex and pornography wasn't juicy enough here. Okay. Um, how as a wife should you submit to your husband while still feeling like you have equal decision-making and equal room for opinions? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the first thing I would say she uh, is. <laughs> she is. Do you want to go first? Because that might help. <laughs> oh, look at this. Mutual submission. Wow. That's great. <clears throat> Christ redefined submission. And the way the world uses that term, they mean subjugation. Someone's ordering someone else around. And that's not how Jesus lived out submission. And Christ redefined headship. He only used his authority to benefit someone else at his expense. Mm -hmm. And when we get away from Christ's model on that, everything falls apart. And so uh, we have an understanding of how that works in our lives. We, we, have, we have lots of conversations. Both of us are verbal, so we talk. <laughs> and uh, in the overwhelming majority of times, we're able to find a solution that we can both agree to. 
I don't think it's my job to come in and, and say to Sue, this is how it's going to be. Now, um, if, if there is something that we cannot agree on and a decision is required, the way that works for us is I get a second vote. And I know I, know I just made a lot of enemies but, and, and a lot of friends all at the same time. <laughs> um, what I will tell you is if I'm making that vote for my own personal benefit, then I'm following a model, a model of, of headship that is not biblical and not Christ-like. Right. And so uh, I don't think there have been two or three times in our entire marriage where I've played that card. And when I did, she trusted me because she saw all the examples of the times when if we didn't, couldn't come to an agreement, I was willing to lay down my side of that because I thought it would benefit her. Mm -hmm. So, I... Mm -hmm. No, everything he said is absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, I trust the man. I just trust him. I trust him with my children. I trust him with my future. I trust him with my life, I trust him. And so that doesn't mean that I don't have an opinion. That doesn't mean that I don't, you know, she has I have opinions. <laughs> I state my case. I have lots of, you know, reasons why. But when it comes right down to it, he gets the final say. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. And it's because we've communicated about what our vision is for our family and what our vision is for our lives. We've talked a lot about what, you know, I have a, I'm a pharmacist, I have a career. He understands fully what, what my expectations were that that was gonna look like. I fully understand what his expectations were of what his vocation was gonna look like. We talk a lot about what we wanted for our children, what we wanted for their lives. And so I never, I guess I never felt unheard and so as long as I felt heard, I trusted him. A, a couple of things. I think that for men in marriage, there's a lot of times they prefer not to lead because they don't want the responsibility of getting it wrong. And that's a real responsibility. Like you, you make a decision to move the family to another part of the country or something like that. Like that's a huge responsibility. And there are times when you have to be willing to bear that. And that's not a power move. It is, all right, you know, this is, this is what we're going to do. And however it goes, like that's, that's on me now. And I think that for lots of men, that's a terrifying thing. And I think sometimes for men, we put decision-making for some things on our wives, not that there shouldn't be conversation, because there should be, but we put those things on our wives because we don't want the responsibility. And that's also a violation of the model of headship that Jesus teaches. I don't think our problem is when we follow a biblical example. I think our problem is when we take the cultural concepts of those terms and try to apply them for our own personal benefit. The only other thing that I would say uh, uh, real quick is that um, I actually play an imagination game in my head where there's something that I think it should be this way and, and, and she would like it this way. So Sue loves to go to the mountains for, for vacation. I like to go to the beach. And so now I don't think we should not go on vacation because we can't agree, or we should take separate vacations because we can't agree. So I will do this imagination thing. I will see myself laying on the beach. It is 82 degrees, the sun is gently growing. There's palm trees. It's the waves are, are gently lapping into the shore. And I'm just sitting there going, oh, this is good. And then I look over and in my imagination, I see Sue and she's not happy. And, and so now is this gonna be a fun vacation? So now I, I will go to Sue and I will say, all right, well, we couldn't decide, so I got the extra vote, so we're going to the mountains. If you use the authority that you have to benefit someone else at your expense, you'll get it right. If you use your authority to benefit yourself at someone else's expense, you will get it wrong. So. That's, that's a word right there. Can we thank these guys for their time and their energy and their wisdom? 
Um, I just wanted to invite you guys once again back in two weeks and thank you guys for coming and you know for making this investment and uh, for showing up for your spouse, for that relationship. It's important and it matters. Um, just before we go, Pastor, I'd love to uh, just have you pray a prayer of blessing over everybody uh, and all these relationships. Um, Father, you created the idea of marriage because you knew how incredibly wonderful it could be. And you gave us the wisdom of your word because you knew how hard it would be. And so I am so grateful that the people who are in this room or watching online right now, they have a sense of the wonder that you have created and the wisdom that you have created. And I'm so grateful for them being willing to make that investment tonight. And I ask that this would be an ongoing reality in their lives, whether they're in rooms like this or not. I ask your, your hand of blessing to be on every marriage here tonight. Yes. I ask that where there is a sense of woundedness or uh, options where trust has been broken, that you would bring your amazing capacity to reconcile and to restore and that marriages would actually be part of our Christian testimony. People would ask us, how are you able to have such a great marriage? And we'd be able to say, it's the love of God in us. Mm -hmm. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.